Mm. Morning, Ms. Deacon. Morning. Uh, now, let me explain the arrangements before Mary invites you to, to affirm. Um, you're talking not just to the audience in front of you, who uh, are a mixture of uh, participants, core participants mainly, um, uh, and lawyers to your left, uh, and I don't think there are any representatives of the press at the moment at the back, but there might be. Uh, but beyond this room, uh, you are talking to a larger number, probably in three figures, who will be watching on a mixture of YouTube or, or live stream. So that's your audience. Um, Ms. Scott will ask you the questions in a moment or two. Can I apologize for the slightly later start than anticipated this morning for various reasons? Uh, but Mary, now's the time for you to invite Ms. Deacon to take the oath. Please state your full name. Susan Catherine Deacon. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Um, I'm going to start with an overview of your parliamentary and post-parliamentary career. So in May 1999, you um, became the uh, member of the Scottish Parliament for Edinburgh East and Musselburgh. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, uh, and um, is it right to understand that you were immediately appointed Minister for Health and Community Care? Yes, when the first ministerial appointments were made a couple of weeks after the election. And you held that post until no November 2001, when you were succeeded by Mr Chisholm. That's correct. Um, you ceased becoming a, a, a member of the Scottish Parliament in 2007. Yes. The, the transcript won't pick up a nod, so <laughs> if you could say, say yes or no. Um, uh, and since then, you've had a range of different roles which are set out in your CV, um, including uh, a press, professor for social change at the University of Edinburgh, and between 2010 and 2011, uh, a role as the Scottish Government and Early Years Advisor and Champion? The, the, my professorship currently with the University of Edinburgh is, is different. That was an earlier position that I had, but there's been a range of positions in there, so I can understand um, the confusion. But it's all detailed in my CV. Yes, and, and uh, I'm not going to set out in detail the roles that you've had, because as you say, there are, are, are many of them, but... Um, just to sort of summarise, you've had a number of roles as either board member or trustee of charities and of arts organisations, including between 2008 and 2011 being a board member of Pfizer UK Foundation, which is a charity distributing money and grants to community health projects. That's correct. Uh, and you've also been a chair or board member of a range of other organisations, including the Institute of Occupational Medicine, the Institute of Directors Scotland, and the Police Authority. That's correct. Uh, do any of the roles um, that you have undertaken create any conflict of interest in terms of the evidence you're going to give to this inquiry? No. Now, since drafting your statement, you've been provided with um, quite a few more documents from the, by the inquiry. So um, your written and oral evidence needs to be seen in, in that context. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I'm well, not sure I understand. Uh, I, it, it, uh, I'm just making the point that since writing your statement, you've had quite a few more documents. Yes, yes, thank you. Yep. Um, and you also tell us in your statement that you, what you would, have liked, you would have liked to see your ministerial diary before writing your statement but that hasn't been made available to you. C can you tell us what kind of information you would have liked to have seen in, in that diary to help you answer the questions that you were asked? I think the questions that I was asked initially required quite a bit of detail um, and chronology around quite a narrow period of time, but it was an exceptionally, exceptionally busy period of time. And my only complete reference point for that would have been the ministerial diary of the time, or at least for meetings that were recorded and so on. But what I've attempted to do is through a combination of 
papers provided to me by the Scottish Government, obviously by the inquiry, and parliamentary records and other public records from the time to be as precise as I can be in my written evidence. Now, were you asked to give evidence to the Penrose inquiry? No, I wasn't. Um, Now, picking up then uh, your role as Minister for Health and Community Care, um, is it right to understand that during your time as the Minister there was only one Deputy Minister? That's correct, yes. And we know from November 2000 that was Mr Chisholm. Who was the Deputy Minister before then? Ian Gray. And the designation at that time was specifically Deputy Minister for Community Care. I think I'm right in saying that changed to being Deputy Minister for Health and Community Care when Malcolm was appointed. So uh, does it follow from that that in your portfolio was the health bit and in his portfolio Essentially, was, yes. was the commu community care bit? What level of liaison was there when you were in post as Minister between yourself and the Secretary of State for Scotland? With regards to the Secretary of State for Scotland specifically, I think this is one of the things that's quite key and unique, I suppose, about the period that I was in office. We were working through the transition, obviously, um, to the new devolved arrangements. So the initial contact was in that transition period. So although we were elected and appointed in May, the powers did not transfer until the 1st of July. So there was a period where, as ministers, we went... Um, able to, to act um, alone in terms of taking decisions and I can remember there being certainly one occasion during that period, there may have been others, where uh, of doing a health announcement jointly with the Secretary of State because that transition period required that. Subsequent to that, um, routinely the, the, there wouldn't be contact with the Secretary of State, there was contact with particularly health ministers in the UK and in Northern Ireland and Wales, and I'm sh sure you want to discuss that further. Um, my main recollection of being involved with the S Secretary of State in Health Matters was through the Joint Ministerial Committee, um, which certainly for its four initial meetings, which at that time were chaired by the Prime Minister and held across the four nations, the attendance from each nation was the Secretary of State the First Minister and the Health Minister of each of the four nations. And so just um, uh, in relation to your involvement with the Secretary of State for Scotland, once powers had been transferred, would you have been in contact with him, I believe it was uh, John Reid at the time, uh, about health matters? No, as I say, not routinely. There may have been there was issues from time to time where he may be copied in if it was a particular issue where there was a key interface, if you like, between the Scottish Executive and the UK Government. But in the main, that relationship would have been with the First Minister. Was there, did you have any liaison or communications with the Department, uh, with, sorry, the um, Treasury at Westminster? No. Turning then to the Civil Service, did you have a programme of regular meetings with senior departmental officials? Regular, yes. Um, frequent. Um, but not necessarily scheduled. Um, I think one of the things that absolutely characterises the early uh, months of devolution, probably the first year or two to some extent, was everything was changing almost by the week and things were evolving and developing and parliamentary activity was was growing almost exponentially. Um, so very often meetings with officials had to be arranged, well, both around the practicalities of that in terms of availability, but also very often were driven by the issues that were arising. But very, yes, frequent meetings. Was there, uh, was there a division uh, during your time between the civil servants working for the Scottish Executive and those working for the Scottish Scot Scotland office? Yes. The, the, I can't comment on what degree of communication or liaison there was, um, but certainly by then, you know, these were two separate offices. Um, as I say, in terms of 
the health department, and my role as health minister, and I, I think the same would be true of other ministers and other departments, insofar as we had an interface with our UK counterparts, by then it would really be on the subject area or with the comparable department at a UK level, or indeed, as I say, Wales and Northern Ireland. I think it is important to stress, though, that at the beginning, like just about everything else, that was all uncharted terrain. So lots of those relationships evolved, developed, had the challenges um, in different ways as, as the months went by. Uh, and so you, you've intimated that actually there would be more liaison with those officials, with civil service to, officials to officials in the Department of Health. Do you know the? Do you know whether there were regular scheduled meetings between civil servants in the Department of Health, civil servants in uh, Edinburgh? I can't comment with any authority about the level of official liaison. I suppose if I was to make a general observation, I would say that, um, like so many things in that period, to begin with, I, I think. You know, there were some pre existing relationships, but it took some time to work out, I think, what relationships ought to look like in the future. Um, but I can't comment really with any knowledge or authority about official level liaison. Uh, and we heard yesterday that the civil servants working for the Scottish Executive are part of the same civil service um, that those officials working for the Scotland. Um, office uh, were part of, uh, and indeed in Westminster, civil servants in Westminster. Did that, during your time, cause any problems? Well, maybe with me, I suppose, just sharing some broader thoughts and reflections around the civil service in that particular period. I think one of the things that's often forgotten about, we use the shorthand of devolution a lot, um, and obviously we take that to mean more often than not 99 in the creation of the Scottish Parliament, but um, one of the important features of, of Scotland is that it had had administrative devolution, as it's referred to, since the late 19th century, since the Scottish office was created. So you had um, a very established, um, albeit department of the UK government, but um, acting across those various areas, which over many decades you know, were, were very different, which included health, house and education, legal system and so on. The big difference that happened in 1999, and critically the whole resident debt of, of devolution at that point, was to create political accountability for all of that, um, and to have ministers who were accountable directly to an elected Scottish Parliament. So at that point, and I, I, I guess I'm, I'm conscious here I'm expressing as, as much an opinion as uh, just giving you an account of some of the factual background, but at that point there needed to be quite a significant transition in terms of the way that the former Scottish office and who then became Scottish executive civil servants worked. And I think, I think it took quite some time for that adjustment to take place. I actually don't think the issue was as much about what these new relationships with UK counterparts might look like, but more to do with the way that ministers were supported um, and how government in Scotland would become more outward facing to respond effectively to those higher levels of accountability. So I guess what I'm saying is that there was a real process of change and flux there, and in my opinion, and I've said it at the time and I've written and spoken about this since, there wasn't nearly as much thought and preparation given to what that should look like at the other side of political devolution as there might have been. And so the transition you mentioned there in terms of the way the civil service worked was a transition from what to what in, in your view? Well, as I say, you know, you, you'd had a long established system, you know, with a smaller group of ministers. And, and can I say that there's, there's no actual implied criticism, criticism in what I'm saying here. It's more my attempt to analyse and explain what I think took place during that period. So, so before 99, you'd had a smaller group of ministers, part of a UK government, largely based in London most of the time, and, you know, a well-established 
um, civil service operation with, as I say, a high degree of administrative devolution across a range of areas in, in Scottish life. Um, and, well, if I give you an example, there was, by definition, relatively little parliamentary scrutiny of what went on. I think I'd be right in saying that the Secretary of State for Scotland, you know, maybe I think it's once a month, might be slightly more frequently, you know, would do questions in the Westminster Chamber, for example. Overnight, the First Minister was weekly, regularly, all the time. Uh, well, not all the time, but certainly weekly First Minister's questions. But, but, but in terms of wider parliamentary media scrutiny and so on, far, far more than before. And for the rest of the ministerial team, of whom there were now more than 20, compared to the handful that had been before, um, we were absolutely um, required to be heavily scrutinised, both by the Parliament and, I have to say, by a voracious media in those early months, um, all the time. And that required... And, and, you know, incidentally, that was one of the reasons we, the, the devolution came about, was for that accountability to take place. But that required a higher level of engagement and communication and a pace of response um, and a, different ways of working with other organisations and so on than had gone before. And as I say, I'm not critical of individuals that it was a struggle, I think, to, to make that transition because I think many of us going in that had been so heavily involved in the devolution project and campaigning politics around it, you know, we were much more ready, I think, to step into that than maybe the officials were. But I do think there could and should have been, you know, a lot more development of both the culture and the capacity of the organisation to deal with all of that because it wasn't just business as usual and sometimes it felt like it was and it just couldn't be. We'll come back and look at one of the briefings that you got early on and, um, and, um, and see how that, that played out. Um, having been appointed in a ministerial post with not having been an MP or obviously not been a, uh, an MSP before, um, were you given any training or help in understanding the parliamentary processes and how to actually push work through as a minister? Well, it's worth noting that for that one moment in time, virtually everyone was in the same boat in that respect. You know, I think there was uh, 129 MSPs. I think there were about 13 or 14 that had that served as MPs in Westminster. Everyone else, everyone else was coming in new to a new way of working. Um, as I say, a completely new line of accountability with the Scottish people. Um, the procedures... Um, <laughs> There had been a big piece of work done over the preceding couple of years through a body called the Consultative Steering Group to draw up a kind of blueprint for how the, the, the Parliament and it, its procedures would work. Um, but it's one thing, I think, to design that before the Parliament exists. It's another thing to actually embed it in practice. So the Parliament itself took a long time for, for all those procedures to, to be developed and built in. So everyone was travelling through that learning process at the same time. And... What I would say is that I actually think for those that had served in Westminster, they just had a different challenge because they had to unlearn a lot. So it was new for everyone. Um, and, yeah, we, we all worked through that together in real time. And they had to unlearn a lot because for the reasons you've already articulated, the, the, the greater scrutiny, the different way of working with different organisations. Absolutely. But, you know, I, it's important to, to say it was an immense privilege to be part of that. You know, many of us used to say it publicly and to each other, you know, how many people ever got the chance to set up a new parliament? It was an amazing period of time. Um, can, can I just explore with you, uh, sort of generally, how you understood policy was to, to, be, to be developed by the Scottish executive, um, being a member of the Labour Party and there being... A, a, a Labour administration in, in power in Whitehall. Uh, to what extent did you and your, to your knowledge, fellow um, MSPs want to develop policy in line with uh, the Labour Party administration in, in, the, in, in, in Whitehall? So I think there's a number of different strands in there, which you know, I'll do my best to address, and I'm sure you'll, you know, uh, say if I haven't. Um, 
first, I think it's important to remember we were a coalition administration. Um, the first post-war coalition at that time in, in the UK, which was another first. We had many of them. Um, so it wasn't by any means as straightforward that it was just a Labour administration. Um, and indeed, you know, when you looked across that new UK devolved health landscape, um, you could see that it was by no means all a single party. So, you know, I remember sitting at Joint Ministerial Committee for Health with the now sadly late David Trimble, an Ulster Unionist, sitting beside his health minister, who was a member of Sinn Féin. You know, we were all sitting around the table together across four nations talking about health. So, so I think it, it's important to see the political variation that existed in the system at the time. And my genuine view would be that, that what was much more important at that time was building relationships, both personal relationships, um, of which there were some pre-existing, obviously people that had served in Westminster together, who were relatively few and far between, as I say, but where they existed, then there was that personal connection. Um, but for most of us, we had to build these personal relationships with other ministers in other parts of the UK. And as with any relationship development, you know, that means both building the human connection, but also getting to know each other about in terms of what you stood for, what you wanted to achieve. Um, and I think whether it was at that one-to-one -one level or as time developed and there was more of these collective conversations and, and so on, I think the other thing, and I was certainly profoundly aware of this in those early months in that first year of devolution, was we were also having to demonstrate that we were, how can I put this? Um, we were a significant and serious operation. Um, we went, just, I won't use some of the pejorative words that were used, used around, uh, around um, in public discourse at the time, but you know, this was a serious parliament with a serious government. And you know, we were going to do the job and we were going to do it well. So we were having to establish that all the time. Um, on the issue of policy, let me again subdivide that. Um, so often this, the discussion around policy post-evolution is, is described in shorthand in terms of devolved and reserved powers. As I've said already, it's not quite so simple as that because there was already enormous divergence in Scotland pre-devolution. We just got the accountability that came with it. Um, the question for us at that point in time was how we would exercise those powers in the best interests of the people of Scotland and how or if, where we had legislative powers, we would use them and how or if we would cooperate with the UK government where that was regarded to be in the best public interest. So there was a convention introduced, for example, at the beginning of the parliament, and I happened to be the first person to, to, to um, deploy it as a minister, called the Sewell Convention, which was where the parliament, if you like, took a conscious decision that even although it had the powers to legislate, it would allow Westminster to legislate because it made more sense for something to be done across the UK on the same basis. In that instance, it was food standards we were working on at the time. And that convention still exists, it's called a legislative consent motion now, but, but, but it's, it's still the same principle. So in every case, in every issue we were dealing with, we always had to consider what was the best way to try and achieve the best progress that we could for the Scottish people. Um, and there were areas, if you take health, where things were already, you, you know, pre-99, were very, very different. And we, just, we built on that. So, you know, I took, for example, a very um, clear position from the early days um, of the Scottish Parliament that we would remove the last vestiges of the internal market in the NHS in Scotland. Now, that was very, very different from where things were at the UK. Um, 
but that was just, I can, uh, you know, that was us building on some of the differences that existed. There were significant areas, and still are, where UK cooperation is essential, and where, for example, I think very recently even, you know, bodies like the JCVI that continue to this day to advise across the UK, and significant areas of regulation that are still UK-wide. So everything had to be looked at um, on a not quite case-by-case -case basis, because some of these things were broader areas, but it was much, much, much more multifaceted and far more questions of, of judgment in there than might have first appeared if you just say, that matter's reserved, that matter's devolved. It was never that simple. So I'm going to move on then to looking at one of the early briefings that you received. Can we turn, please, to SCGV 40176 underscore 118? And this is a briefing we've already looked, a document we've already looked at, so um, I'm not going to go through the detail with it, but with you, but you can see it's dated the 15th of July 1999, and it's to you. And then it says green folder. What was green folder? That was uh, civil service speak for any correspondence that the minister was to deal with. Uh, and then we can see the purpose there to brief the minister on the Haemophilia Society's continuing campaign for compensation for haemophiliacs infected with hepatitis C as a result of NHS treatment using blood or blood products. And I just want to, if we can just have the whole page, I just want to flick through it with you. So we can see page one sets out the background. If we go over to page two, uh, that continues. Um, uh, and uh, we can see at paragraph four, uh, it says there, the previous administration rejected claims for a no-fault compensation and then sets out the previous administration's grounds for doing so. And then it continues down um, with more background. Um, and then if we go over the page, um, it says at seven how the issue's been dealt with on a UK-wide basis in the past. And, um, and then it makes a recommendation at, at, at paragraph nine. Um, in light of the fact that the Department of Health have rigorously examined this issue twice in recent years, and that the Haemophilia Society have not produced fresh evidence to support their claim for financial assistance, we advise that a further examination of this issue would only draw the same conclusions previously reached. We therefore recommend that the Minister endorses the decision taken by her predecessor and signs the attached reply. Um, is this typical of the sort of briefings you were getting then, building on what you told us about, about the officials at that time? So let me place this in context and in a timeline, because I think this, well, I hope this is relevant and useful for the, for the inquiry. Um, the election took place in May. Um, in fact, you know, if you, if you do that timeline, I'll do it very briefly. You know, if you go from 97, you know, the referendum where 75% of people voted for, for a Scottish Parliament was in 98. The legislation that put the Parliament in place was in 98, uh, sorry, 97, the referendum. The legislation in 98, the Parliament elected in 99. Within, as we touched on earlier, within a couple of weeks, ministers were appointed, but the powers did not transfer till the 1st of July. So I, I make the point, and I think this is important, this was two weeks after the powers had transferred. Um, and I speak about this submission um, in, my, in my own statement. And I have to say, and I should say this before going further anyway, there are enormous amounts of detail about that period of my life, I'm not just talking about this issue, that I have the very hazy recollections of. It was so busy, there was so much going on, and there's been lots of documents that I've seen um, through the course of the inquiry that, you know, I don't have a recollection of or meetings I didn't remember being at. You know, it's more than 20 years ago, and as I say, it was an exceptionally busy time. But I did remember this paper when I saw it. And I remember it registering with me for even talking about the substantive issue, but the language of it, and it brought it back to me when I read it in preparing for the inquiry, Words like, um, I don't think it's the page that you've got in front of me, but, but there's reference to, repeated reference to the previous administration. Repeated references to your predecessor. 
And I remember that really rankling with me because I didn't see the world that way. And I don't think many of us did, actually, in that new administration. Maybe it took the former Scottish Office Ministers a little bit longer to adjust. But for most of us coming in, we saw ourselves as being something new, a first. And this notion of, well, somebody's done it before you and therefore you should too, actually had relatively low traction in and of itself. Um, and I, I just remember that. I remember that distinctly. Um, and therefore, when you then apply that to the issue in hand, and this issue in particular, the insufficiency for me, and I say this knowing very, very, very little about the background and history to matters involving infected blood and blood products at that time. But the insufficiency for me of just saying the, and forgive me, I know <laughs> inverted commas in there don't translate to, to the transcript either, but that your predecessor and that the previous administration had agreed something in and of itself was, was completely insufficient. It was completely insufficient for me to take a decision and it absolutely would not stand up to scrutiny with the Scottish Parliament as a reason for doing anything, frankly. So, yeah, that, that submission, um, I think, was illustrative of a way of thinking. And again, for me, that spoke to, and you know, this linked to a lot of my professional background and so on, it spoke to the fact there just had not been a systematic process of training and developing um, the people working in the office um, to think about what day one of a devolved administration might look like, what it might be, and what standards of scrutiny and accountability we, we might want to, to meet. So in that last comment, I suppose what I'm implicitly saying there was I never felt, I would I feel irritated and disappointed when I saw that kind of language. I never felt, in a sense, overly critical of individuals because I could see that people were working the way they knew how to work um, and they wanted to be supportive, I think, of ministers. But there was, at that time, I think, quite a gulf between what I think many of us felt we needed and wanted to be, and what the practice in the office was, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so having received this submission, we know that your response was not to um, take, follow what the, necessarily follow what the, uh, your, and again, I put in inverted commas, predecessor was. So can you, can you tell us what, what, what your decision was and what the response from, from officials but was to, to, to that? I can't um, in any detail in the sense that I can only tell you what I have seen of those papers that have been made available to me, coupled with obviously what I can remember. There will perhaps be other um, stages or steps or, or you know, other paper around. I mean, I can see from having looked through the paper, there must be other papers um, at, at that time. But as I've set out as best I could in my written statement, I've shared with you what my, my reaction was to that paper. Um, and in truth, I, I wasn't sure how to proceed. I just didn't want to proceed in the way that was recommended to me. Um, and on the one hand, you could say, well, it's one letter to one MSP, and we were starting to get letters by the hundreds from not just MSPs, but from lots and lots of people and organisations from right across the country. So you could say it's just one letter. But of course, the minute you as a minister pen a response, even to one letter, you've made a policy statement. So I... I had a great anxiety about, you know, how to respond to this. And 
if it's appropriate, it's maybe relevant for me at this stage, as I've said in my written statement, to just wind back slightly, because as an issue, and I'm talking about that moment in time, not what I knew subsequently or what I know now, but as an issue, this had been around, if I can put it in those terms, during the election campaign, alongside lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other campaigning issues. Um, it, more MSPs were, were getting um, involved and interested in the Haemophilia Society, did a lot very, very early targeted campaigning and lobbying with the new parliament. By that time, I'd been appointed health minister, so you know, unlike during the election, where I'd been the education spokesperson and the campaign team, and very, very attuned to what was the debate that was taking place in that part of, of uh, the world, if you like, I had very quickly adjusted to, to trying to um, pick up what some of the priorities for members might be, and it was clear that a number of members. Um, you know, we're taking a very keen interest in the campaign. I think it would be fair to say, with the exception of a couple who had previously served in Westminster and had had some involvement with the issue and with campaign previously, I think many MSPs were at a very early stage of, you know, really understanding what the background and history was. But they clearly were seeing this was something that should be raised. So, on my instincts, and I think in politics you have to rely on your instincts a lot, and I think in that first year of devolution many of us had to rely on them a great deal. All my instincts were, um, certainly, as I say, not to respond in the way that was suggested. But my other instincts, and this also came from a lot of my wider life and work experience, was also not to do or say anything precipitous, because although I didn't know what sat underneath all of this, I knew there was a lot that did and a lot of sensitivities and a lot of complexity. And I think I'm right in saying, and I say my submission, I think, because I, this is the kind of detail that I, I can't be precise on unless anybody shows me anything to the contrary. I think I, I, I just didn't, um, I, for a couple of weeks, um, take a decision on that, or on a response. Um, the version that you've put in front of me, I, uh, this is what enables me, I think, to be precise about timing in, in a way, um, is I think the, the then Deputy Minister had seen it, which signals to me that I think I might have been out of the office at that period, because I think I spent a lot of time in the early summer trying to use the recess to go out and visit different parts of the country. Um, because we were very tied to Parliament prior to that, and tied to Edinburgh, and of course the other thing that we wanted to do in the early days of devolution was show that this was not just a Parliament for the central belt of Scotland, which was a, another significant issue. So I, I am guessing that um, I might not even have seen that on the date that it was produced. And I think I'm right in saying that I still hadn't decided how to respond and I'm sure it was probably sitting amongst a range of other things that were requiring attention and maybe I similarly hadn't taken decisions on when there was a subsequent um, submission which I've referred to in my statement and which I suspect may come on to which I think was dated the 8th of August. So um, I don't know if you want me to turn to that now but that was really the next time I had occasion to formally consider a submission related to the issue of compensation for hemophiliacs with hepatitis C. The, the, the decision that you ultimately made was that you would, is this right, have a commission, an, an internal investigation? N no, can I can I can I stay with with this period in time and some of the detail on this because I think this is very important because I've had lots of references made and lots of um, different descriptors used of investigations, inquiries, and so on. And I I think it is really important to understand how I and the executive at that moment in time started to 
if you like, lean in to what was clearly a complex and sensitive issue with a long history. Um, and I think, you know, that's much more textured than that. So if it is possible to bring up the submission from the 8th of August... I think it's the 5th... Is it the 5th the of 5th, August? The 5th, I beg your pardon. It, that's WITN 4436... Zero zero four, I think is the right. Uh, is that the one you were thinking yes. of? Yes. Yes. And I'm, and and I may say in that intervening period, you know, it's just a couple of weeks, obviously. But again, I, I'm sorry, I can't be precise about this at all. But wherever I had the opportunity on lots of different issues at that time. I was working very hard to try and read myself into um, the background to issues. I had a lot of background in terms of my previous work in life that, on, and some of the wider issues about the NHS and, and health policy and so on that, that were by no means new. But some of those issues with you know, such a background in history, I was taking time to try and find out more and relying a lot, I think, and you know, a lot of... Um, discussions with people as well. So I don't know, I don't think I had had discussions with officials at that stage, but it's perfectly possible I might have started to talk to others, including MSPs with a prior interest and so on, to try and just get a sense of, of some of the issues involved. However, the next formal submission, as I say, that came before me is the one that you've put up on screen. Um, and... Shall I, shall I take you to, to, to what you're being asked, your suggest, what, what's being yes, suggested to you? Yes, I think that's at page you. two. So this, arri this is arises out of a, uh, a, a, a BBC inquiry because they're planning to run a story on claims for compensation from haemophiliacs who have contracted hepatitis C as a result of infected blood. And if we look at the bottom of page two... And the background is set out, and then it says lines to take. We propose that the following line be given in response to the inquiries from the BBC. And then if we go over the page, we can see what's said there. The actions taken by the NHS in Scotland in the, in the 1980s to ensure the safety of blood products administered to haemophiliacs do not suggest that there was any negligence on the part of the health services, given the state of knowledge at that time about protection against hepatitis C and the practical difficulties of introducing a hepatitis C product any sooner in Scotland. This suggests that compensation for this set of patients, tragic as their case may be, would not be appropriate, as compensation should only be paid where the NHS or individuals working in it have been at fault. Of course, it is open to the Scottish Parliament to discuss the matter, and the executive would have no objection to these issues being aired in debate, if members so wish. Thank you. And just to comment briefly on about very much a secondary matter, but again, like that first submission to just give a sense of the prevailing culture at the time. That last paragraph, again, I remember this in a way that I don't necessarily remember other things, but that last paragraph of saying, of course it is open to the Scottish Parliament to discuss the matter, and the executive would have no objection to these issues being aired in a debate if members so wish. I mean, it was inconceivable on any issue that we could use that kind of language. It was entirely up to the Parliament what they debated and discussed. It was not for us to give permission or say we'd have no objection. So just in a microcosm, that paragraph there, I suppose, speaks to that wider change that we were going through. But to go back to the important substantive issues and obviously how they relate to matters that, that we're discussing today, I think what was important for me with these two submissions, and just to illustrate the sort of starting point for the new executive, was that on that 15th July submission, you have a few pages that you know, basically says, this has all been looked at, the generality of the issue, the, gener the, the totality of, of, of the issue of compensation for, for haemophiliacs with hepatitis C, and by extension, others infected, and so on that that had all been looked at, it was all done, and there was no requirement for us to, to look at this any further on the basis of a couple of, couple of pages. Now what we had, and it's, it's important to, to um, set out the genesis of this, if you go to the, the beginning of this paper, well, that's page um, one. if you could please, um, 
you'll see that the story that the BBC is about to run is based on um, information that the Haemophilia Society has provided to the BBC, which I think I'm accurately quoting from the Haemophilia Society's press release at the time, was described as worrying new evidence that um, there had been a discrepancy between the time when the heat, heat treatment of blood products had been introduced um, in Scotland um, to eliminate the HCV virus and when that had been done in England and there was a disparity there. So that was another the story um, that was going to, and the report that was going to be run and that's what I was being asked to respond to. Now having had a very brief submission that said that the wider issues required no further examination, what I now had and, and again, you know, I put this in its context of the very early stages of our new devolved administration. What I now had was something that was specific to Scotland, albeit historical, about an agency that now fell within the devolved administration. And again, I was being given a couple of paragraphs that basically said, look, we think everything's fine here, there's reasons for this. And the quote that you read out, of course, was a, a very reassuring quote that, that we were then to give to national media to say this was all fine. So again, for me, that was insufficient. That was just insufficient. You couldn't, both in terms of the importance of the issue, but also the, the way that we wanted to develop decision making in Scotland at that time and the accountability that we had, the, the, the gap there was immense. And I took a decision at that point um, certainly at the very least at the very least that we had to examine properly um, what had happened in, in the 80s around heat treatment um, and to set out the facts as best we could in the the public domain and again that might not seem particularly radical or novel now but it speaks to that period of time where we were trying to sort of open the doors and let the light shine in to decision making in Scotland and it was clear to me that we would we would have to do that we would have to set out you know factual information it, you know, it was inconceivable that I could just stand up when the parliament came back and be asked about this and say, oh no, it's fine. It's, you know, I've had some assurances, read out a couple of paragraphs and, and move on. Um, equally, um, I was not about to initiate, you know, a major piece of work around all this because we hadn't, we didn't, weren't even at first base of knowing just, just what else sat underneath this. And the degree of, well, you've seen it, advice and caution um, around uh, the department and, and I think amongst my colleagues as well, you know, was, uh, you know, was such that, again, you know, I wasn't going to do anything precipitous on this. Um, but it needed to be looked at and it needed to be understood better. And so what was... So I did two things at, at that time on the back of the second submission, which you know, were just my own um, decisions at that moment to, to start to steer a different course on this, but in a practical and pragmatic way, I suppose. Um, and that was one, um, to instruct the department to pull together proper facts on this, you know, not two paragraphs, but, you know, like, can we get the information? You know, I mean, I do believe passionately, and I do to this day, that your starting point for any informed discussion and any informed decision-making is to try, try and establish some basis of fact. And if facts are contested, well, that's fine. That's how knowledge moves on, but you need to have something there to, to work on. So I wanted to bring that out. I wanted to make sure that, that 
it was understood what had happened in that precise moment in time that the Haemophilia Society specifically had raised in relation to Scotland um, at that point. And the second thing, which again um, wasn't necessarily preferred option or, or recommended as far as the department was concerned, or not, and, and I found this, I have to say, in relation to many external organisations, but um, I wanted to speak to the Mephilia Society and I wanted to hear from people who had experienced this in Scotland. And, you know, I, I just note that there was a... The other thing I remember very vividly from that period of time was that there was a bias, if you like, against meetings. Now, some of it was because the, the demand for ministers' time had just grown exponentially overnight with, with devolution. And you couldn't do everything and be everywhere, absolutely. But there was also that um, element of, let's call it protection, um, of, of, you know, the minister doesn't need to meet with this group or that group. So I remember frequently during that period, I actually kind of didn't come up specifically in this, in this case because the question hadn't even been posed and the Haemophilia Society hadn't contacted us. So the officials hadn't said anything on that front, but I knew for sure that from all the other recommendations that were starting to get, that, that they would generally, let's put it, err on the side of caution in terms of um, whether the minister should go and meet with people where there was a difficult or controversial issues. So for me, it was important to just, you know, cut through all of that and just say on the day, there and then, no, I want to meet with the society. I want the department to look into it more, and that's what we tell the BBC. This is, excuse me, <coughs> you know, there's a new minister, there's a new executive, and yes, it was, it, it, it was blurred to some extent because there was some element of continuation at ministerial level as well from those that had been in the Scottish office, but it was a new executive with a new minister, and. For me, it was just really important um, to say, you know, I'm willing to take a fresh look at this. So I know I've made, um, I've gone into some detail around those two dates and those two submissions, but for me, they were really, they're illustrative. They're illustrative, I think, of wider context, which I think is, is, is important. But they are also absolutely the the point at which you know I set something else in train. How things then evolved and developed, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about. But but that was that was the starting point. And did you, given what you've told us about the culture and uh, and so on, did you have any concerns at that point that the investigation into establishing the facts, I think you call them the proper facts, would be undertaken in an objective and open and comprehensive manner? Um, no, it's a short answer, because when I initiated that piece of work, and I, I, I do stand by this, you know, I've thought about it a lot, even in reflecting back, you know, 20 years on, um, it was absolutely the sensible next stage next step to take. You're moving from, you know, a page of sort of fairly high level reassurance, you know, to saying, well, you know, okay, sh sh show your workings then, you know, whether it's the department, whether it's SMBTS. Fine, if that's the case, you know, if everything that, that could be done at that time was done, set it out, find out. And that was, if you like, part of this new way of working in Scotland, was to, to at least raise the bar about what we would be willing to, as government, look at and set out publicly. Um, so, this... As things went on, other lines of inquiry and fact-finding became added on, if you like, to that process. But it was very, very clear that it was absolutely an initial um, step to try and shine some light on this on the issue and specifically the Scottish specific issue if I can put it that way because 
The other thing that was becoming crystal clear to me and came, became, certainly became crystal clear the more that I, I, I did look into the issue and entered into discussion with uh, the Haemophilia Society was the extent to which the wider issues were intertwined and inextricably linked with all sorts of UK-wide decisions and practices. Um, and all the many years of history that went back, you know, that was clear to me from a very early stage that it was going to be acutely difficult um, for us as a Scottish administration to really address all of that. But what we could do was we could at least focus on this, this issue that had gained quite a lot of profile and traction and the health committee said they wanted to inquire, uh, you know, have an investigation into it and so on. What we could do was, was pull that information together for that period. And as I say, I, I do believe fundamentally that it's so important to get information out and then for it to be debated. And at that time especially, the parliament and its committees were to be the vehicle that we would create that openness. Um, so it was a starting point on that journey. At a time where I may say the parliament wasn't even yet sitting, but you know that such is the timeline of how early on this was in the devolution process. The first, the parliament opened officially with its powers on the first of July, and then went immediately into recess, and then didn't sit for the first time until the first of September. So that was the period we were in. Can I? Can we turn then next to, to take it to the eighth of September, nineteen ninety nine? SCGV at five zeros forty three underscore zero four seven. And again, this is a document we've already looked at. So again, I don't want to take time going through it. I just want to draw your attention to one point. If we could just have the first page, we can see what it is. 8th of September, a submission to you. We can see the purpose of it at paragraph one, to provide initial briefing to the minister prior to her meeting with the Haemophilia Society on the 14th of September to hear their concerns about the um, infected blood. Uh, and it was, um, I then didn't want to go over to the annex, um, please, which start, annex B, which starts at page seven. So we can see here, um, it's called hepatitis C and the development of factor eight, a brief overview arising from investigations carried out so far. And then, it sets out the background and it goes through various uh, topics that the officials have looked at. And then if we can just take it to page 10, please. And we can see there a paragraph 18, initial conclusions and uh, initial impression from this outline of events which has been gathered from our preliminary investigations are SMBS did all they could at the time to develop a factor eight product which was safe from HCV given the state of knowledge at the time. Um, no evidence SMBTS lagged without good reason behind England um, and the um, uh, Haemophilia Society's claim that Scotland's 500 to 600 Haemophilia patients may have been exposed to the risk of hepatitis C infection for up to a year longer than people treated in the UK can be firmly rebutted. And the question I just wanted to ask you was this. What, were you um, surprised or concerned that um, preliminary... Um, conclusions have been made at this early stage before meeting with and, and hearing the case that the Haemophilia Society was concerned about? So, so let me make two points of that that um, I think are, are, are important. Um, one in terms of process, if you go back, you know, the submission on the 8th of August, what um, the, officials, you know, the officials had already obviously got an initial answer to the question on the question that had been raised by the Haemophilia Society about heat treatment in the 80s. And they said in that submission, and we will look into this further in the next few weeks. And what I did was raise that up a level to say, no, it needs to be much fuller than that, there needs to be other inputs to it, and it's going to be published. It's going, you know, it'll be out there. You know, it's not just for me, so I can stand up and give a short answer in the chamber or whatever. You know, there's going to be a basis for that there. So, on that particular issue, the fact that they were continuing to iterate, here's what we think from our preliminary investigations. I actually 
think that was part of that progression. And for me, given there was going to be something at some point that was going to go out publicly, you know, that's that's how you test, the, you know, the information. Um, but what I would say, and this is where you link back to the way that the that, that official advice worked and so on at the time, was, and forgive me for generalising, so I realise, and I do want to focus absolutely on the people and the issues that we're talking about today, but this was, for me, a real generic pattern at the time that you would say as a minister, and I can remember with colleagues, we'd, we'd actually talk about this and chuckle about it sometimes, you know, we'd say, right, we want to meet with a group because we wanted to meet with them and we wanted to speak to them and hear from them and have a free-flowing conversation with them. And you would get this um, pile of information that was all this briefing and here's all the government position and here's what the agenda might be and here's what the minister should say. And to be honest, rather than going toe-to-toe -to -toe with that, you know, I think many of us just said, well, thank you. You know, we cast an eye over the sort of background briefing and we'd enter into a discussion. Um, and insofar as I can recall from all that time ago, you know, I think a submission like that, which was sitting alongside lots and lots and lots of other things like that, I don't think that I would have, I think I would have seen it in that, that light, basically. Because as far as I was concerned, I wanted to go and have a discussion. You know, well, you know, thank you, you've put all this together. Yes, we're going to push ahead with, with something that will go out into the public domain at some point in this. But, you know, I want to have the conversation. Um, but, like so much in this inquiry, to be honest, it's, it's brought back to me just, just practices that at the time... And I don't think, as I say, this is this is about criticising individuals. I don't think it's sinister or anything. It was just a pre-existing practice um, of, you know, keeping things very closed and and thinking that, you know, sometimes ministers shouldn't be allowed out alone just to, to speak to folk and just make up their own minds. Now, you you subsequently met with the Haemophilus Society on, on the 14th of September, and there's a, a minute of a note, which I don't think we need to go to. Um, uh, um, uh, and the question for you in relation to that is that that minute doesn't record you saying to the Haemophilus Society, look, these are our preliminary I I conclusions. You know, is there anything you would like to... to, to any, anything, any evidence that you would like to submit to us to... Th that's relevant to those conclusions. Is that, is that right? That, no, that wasn't no, shared with them? No, no. Well, absolutely. The, the, these comments from officials about from their preliminary investigations weren't shared because as far as I was concerned, that's all that they were. There were comments from officials at preliminary stage. The point was about entering into discussion with the Haemophilia Society was absolutely to find ways of engaging them in that process. Um, now, I, I would be the first to say in this and frankly a host of other areas that was, you know, kickstarting activity at that time, you know, that you could you could spend, you know, and over the years actually there has been a lot more investment in much bigger, broader consultative engagement processes and so on. But at that moment in time, insofar as we had the capacity and resource to do it, and given that the starting point of the department was basically no change, no engagement, then, you know, having that meeting, and if you look at the work that, that came through that, um, there were discussions with Haemophilia Society, there were inputs from um, Haemophilia Acts in Scotland from their experience. Now, I, I you know, can see through a, a lens, and I understood then as well, you know, that there was there were many other issues to be raised and to investigate it, but in terms of looking into the specific issues there, um, there were discussions. And there was also, of course, a meeting with SMBTS, with the Haemophilia Society, which I don't think, others would obviously correct me, I don't think that had happened previously. And that was also an attempt to try and create some more of that dialogue and try and open it up. Um, so I, I understand the point that, that you're making, and but I, I keep coming back to, I think it's important to see the progression 
of thinking and decisions and actions on this issue in tandem with that massive culture change that was taking place in a context of hundreds of different issues coming from all directions, many of which you know, were in the programme for government, many of which had been in manifestos. You know, there was no previous manifesto commitment around any of the issues involved here, for example, albeit there was MSP interest. You know, there were so many things that we had to do that for me this was a practical and pragmatic way of starting to try and open it up and to create some, some dialogue and to bring some background and facts out into the open that wouldn't just be for me, but would be for the parliamentarians as well. And I just, just read the um, uh, document reference for the, for, the, for the minute for the Haemophilia Society meeting um, into the transcript, which is WITN 443. 6005 and also just so that we understand the chronology just to, uh, during that meeting the the remit of the investigation the internal investigation was widened wasn't it to look beyond the heat treat, treatment issue and to look at the, the the information given to patients during their treatment around risks of hepatitis c or non a non b as it was then and around um testing yeah, so it started out as being a fact-finding exercise to answer the question that the Haemophilia Society had raised about that period in time. Um, there was no remit beyond that. It was set out the facts. We entered into discussion with the Haemophilia Society. I say we, I had a meeting, but subsequently there were other channels of communication. Um, but arising, I think, actually, from the meet meeting that I was involved in, Obviously, there were a range of different other questions raised, including issues about information to patients. So subsequent to that, there was a published remit. So we didn't start with a remit. We started to say, let's compile more facts. But, and I think I've got the dates. In fact, I'm sure I put this into my statement. Um, but we then moved to some definition around the published remit. There was also... Um, an exchange of correspondence, all of which, again, it's referred to, to in my statement. Following that meeting um, between myself and Karen Pappenheim, the, the chief executive of the Haemophilia Society, um, with an attempt, you know, on, on my part, you know, to, to put some parameters and, and scope some of the work that we could do, um, and to take on board questions and concerns that we could do, but also to be clear about, you know, what we couldn't do. Um, so it, it iterated, but again, as I say in my statement, I can't remember the, the exact phrase that I used, but it, it did become clear to me very, very early on that um, it was going to be difficult to find a way of... of working through this um, and to manage expectations um, because having said you know in a, sincerely you know that, that I wanted to take a, a fresh look at this I knew that the parliament did too it was clear that there were just so many strands of issues and history and complexity around this that that and forgive me if this sounds you know slightly clinical but in terms of how we could manage that within not just the devolved powers but you know the whole capacity and resource that we had the processes that still hadn't even been developed to be honest it, it was clear to me very early on it was going to be very difficult but I still thought it was right to at least try and and as I say, shed a bit of light on at least one dimension um, of what had happened in Scotland and to start to engage in a bit more direct interaction with the people involved. Just for the transcript, um, that correspondence, or some, certainly some of that correspondence with Karen Pappenheim is, is SCGV 40170 underscore 015 and HSOC 30. 
Uh, I want to move on to a, a, an issue that was uh, uh, um, raised with you by the Health um, and Community Care Committee in June 2000 about the remit of the investigation. Um, now, they sent you a letter, I'm not going to turn to this, but for the transcript, it's SCGV 40171-005 on the 7th of June, and you replied, and I want to turn to that, SCGV 40171-010. Uh, and you replied on the uh, SCGV, was that? Oh, there we go, on the 13th of June. Um, and you say, thank you for your letter of 7th of June. Uh, you asked whether the exercise I have in instigated covers non-haemophiliacs who might have contracted hepatitis C through contaminated blood products, and if not, to extend the remit to include them. And then you go on in the next paragraph to say, that you'd instigated an exercise following the specific concerns expressed a year ago about the discrepancy in the heat treatment of factor eight between Scotland and England in the period 85 to 87. Having listened carefully to representations from the Haemophilia Society, I made sure the remit of the exercise is worded so as to concentrate on this issue. I believe it's generally accepted that other people have con contracted the hepatitis C virus via blood in other ways for example, through blood transfusions before a test was available to screen blood for the virus. The virus was only isolated and identified in 1989. I would see limited value in directing resources towards examining an issue of which we already know the outcome. And for this, this reason, I must respect, respectfully decline your request to open up the exercise further. Um, can you just help us with what, what you meant there by... Um, uh, ex limited value in examining an issue which we already know the outcome. Um, just to, to confirm my understanding, this was 7th June 2000. So if oh, we no, go... Sorry, is this a ref it, it's this 2000, June. yes. So... If I could again put some context around this. Um, by that time... The work that I had kick-started in a given moment, on a given day, faced with a particular decision about what to, to say publicly in this issue that could enable us to start to engage positively and practically um, with such again complex and sensitive issue that piece of work as I say was started in August there is actually it's in amongst the papers there's correspondence at the early stage and you know, it seems bizarre actually looking at this now but bearing in mind that initially it was focused facts on, on a specific issue it was originally said that that could be compiled within a month and that was in the public domain, that was, that was there. Having met with the Haemophilia Society in September, and I'm sorry, I will come back to this under the specific point you're raising, but I just want to explain where this sits in the sort of chronology, if that's all right. Um, so we met with the Haemophilia Society in September. That then resulted in other questions being raised. That resulted in other areas of inquiry being taken on board. As I say, SNBTS met with um, the Haemophilia Society or representatives of, of Haemophilia groups in Scotland as, as well, I think. At that time, there was various discussions. Um, so the period was extended. This was, this was the point. The period was extended until December to allow submissions, um, whether from the society or from individuals, and indeed from Haemophilia Centre directors, I think, you know, who were all feeding into this process that was kind of growing by then. Um, so we were then into the spring, um, and in that period there still continued to be further strands of examination and investigation. And the submission, which I know is in amongst inquiry documents and I think is referred to in, in, in my own statement, the submission that the Haemophilia Society made to this limited 
fact-finding exercise that we'd, we'd initiated, which I don't recall seeing fully at the time, but I have seen submissions where certainly it was referred to. It was a very um, full submission covering the whole range of different issues um, that sat in that whole debate about how to examine, how to address, how to um, support, you know, people who had been um, affected by infected blood and blood products across that whole range of issues. So we were sitting with a limited piece of work that was being done on a specific area and all the wider issues that have been raised, not just in relation to Scottish issues, but, but, but you know, UK matters too. So the gap there was really significant. So I remember during that latter period, and bear in mind that we said that we'd get something out in this fairly quickly, we then had agreed to, to, to look at more things. I remember getting very, very seized during that period of the need for us to put parameters around what we could, at that point in time, actually report on and comment on. Because by that time, too, um, this was definitely an issue that the Parliament was going to look at further as well, not least because there had been two petitions sub submitted through the new public petitions process that was put in place when the Parliament came into being. Um, so the detail of that letter and the phrase that you've read, read out to me, and like so many letters, I know ministers always look at these things and think, oh, somebody, somebody else drafted this, it's not quite how I would have put it if I'd had time to relate everything. But um, while the phraseology is, is not something that I would have initiate, initiated on myself, I think what we were also going through there by then was a process of trying to put some parameters around this initial range of discussions and inquiries that we'd undertaken to be able to put that out into the parliamentary process for further examination and further discussion. It was crystal clear to me by that time that um, there were just so many limitations of what we could actually look at, address, inquire into, and so on at our own hand within, um, not, just, not just within the Scottish Exec as a devolved Scottish Exec, but I have to keep contextualising this, within that very early period where we were trying to do so much across so many different areas um, and the disconnect. Sometimes, you know, when I work through processes like this when I was a minister and have done before and since, sometimes when you get in a room with people and you start to identify issues and a problem, you can work together and you can find a way through. On this occasion, it was like we'd just gone further and further apart and it was, it was really difficult to think about how that could be brought back together. Um, but there was going to be ongoing debate and discussion, so for us to put as much as we were able to into that and allow that discussion to continue, I think was was where we were. And I'm sure we'll come on to the issue of compensation, but but by then also I as I had clearly got more and more deeply into background and discussions on those issues too and. So I knew that I had to be clear about what we'd found around the issue of the introduction of heat treatment and be public about that, because I'd committed to that, um, but try and find some other way of moving on that wider discussion and, and range of issues. And again, for the transcript, the haemophilia submission is PRSE 301404. Um, the, I'm conscious of it due to take a break, break, but I just want to ask one follow-up question from what you've said. The, the range of issues, the complexity, these are, uh, are terms you keep coming back to. Did, did you, uh, at that time, think, well, actually, this is too much for an internal investigation. Really, we need to be looking at a public inquiry. So, um, <laughs> and if, if time is limited, um, you know, maybe, maybe you, you would prefer my answer to, 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 to be later, but I think there are two... For me, in my mind, in that period in time, 
and I think it's important I explain this because I know this has been a substantive issue of interest. There are two distinct questions, distinct but related questions here. One is the question of a statutory public inquiry, and the other is the question of how, if, when, or whether to conduct further investigations. But I make a very clear distinction in my own mind, and I did at the time in thinking this through. Um, if there's time, I, do you want me to see more at this point about about those decisions and my thinking at that time? Well, perhaps perhaps we can come back to that after okay. the break. Well, let, let me let me just ask before we we do take a break. Um, just looking at this letter, it may not be a letter you drafted, but it's a letter that uh, you signed and was sent on your behalf. The issue, looking at the last sentence of the second paragraph, I see limited value in directing resources towards examining an issue of which we already know the outcome. Uh, was the issue that which you refer to in the first paragraph, first full paragraph, whether the exercise you've instigated covers non-hemophiliacs who might have contracted hepatitis C through contaminated blood products? Or was it something else? I think, um, like a lot of communications that I have seen from this time, I think there's an ambiguity around that, and I think that reflected actually some of the challenges of, of working through things. Um, I think in my own head, um, there, it, it, it was as clear as I could be from the information that I'd seen on the specific issue that had been raised in relation to that period in Scotland, I you know, thought we had assembled a reasonable basis of facts there around that question. Well, you, I think the, the extension, yeah, the, 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 I'm sorry. The, the, the first question is what the question is. I know. No, I, I understand that. I understand that. And I think, I think and I've seen from rereading through lots of discussions I think there was a circularity, and not just for us, but in others that have been involved in uh, in this matter over the years, which was what was known, what wasn't known, what needs to be looked into, for you know. So I think the, the health committee specifically wanted us to look more widely into non-hemophiliacs and others who had um, been infected through blood transfusions, and I think. Um, that probably what was intended by that, well, that that reference in there was to say that well we know what happened and of course that lies at the heart of this inquiry as to how much did we know what happened and I think in my head which is maybe slightly different there was an issue about we have to draw some lines around the work that we've done we don't have the capacity, the capability the wherewithal to actually open all of these matters up and we need to complete the piece of work we started and pass it on to the next stage of open discussion. So if, if the issue is uh, giving hepatitis C or, or uh, contracting hepatitis C through contaminated blood products, which uh, it, it's an ambiguous word, as you, as you say, you're, you're right about that, um, but assuming that it means that, the outcome is what? People were infected. Um, is it sufficient to say, well, people were, in effect, people were given hepatitis C or may have contracted hepatitis C through blood or blood products and they got hepatitis C? I mean, what, what's, what, what's the outcome? What's meant by this? It, it, it looks, uh, I think, to, or may look to some, as though this letter is just following someone off. Well, as I say, for my part, I, I was clear by that stage we needed to draw a line through this work and be able to pass something on to the Parliament so that they could start the process that they had committed to do that was on hold. So I think there was a... I, I completely understand the point that you raised, but I think there was a very practical and pragmatic sense in my head that we couldn't keep having more strands of... adding more strands of inquiry onto something that started out very focused and very fact-based, which was now starting to move into highly contested areas and would require far more investigation than we had put in place. So that's, that's where I was coming from. I think 
and I, I do feel it sits at the heart of so many of the issues of inquiry, <clears throat> and I've thought about this as I've looked back through the papers from my time in office. You know, undoubtedly at that point in time, and the advice that was repeatedly being given was, we know what happened. We know what happened here, so why look any further? Um, and I think what was possibly also confused and conflated, possibly even, dare I say, in some of the parliamentary discussion, was the question of the past and the question of the present. So I think, you know, the present is the question of how you support and potentially give financial support or compensation to people now. And then the past, of course, is what happened in the past. And then, of course, by that stage in time, the two had got so confused and conflated. And I think in every, every part of the UK, we were just stepping into a part of it that I think that's what you see, I think, in a lot of that, that ambiguity. And, you know, I, I'm sitting here now and I've poured over these documents um, and thought through just where we were as a devolved administration at that time and reflecting on what I could, should, might have done differently and better, and there's always so much. But in that point in time, including what was often very inadequate and, yes, ambiguous communication, it was part of what was coming through. And certainly as a minister, there was just limitations in how much you could drill in, how much you could question, how much you could amend, how much you could clarify, how much you could change. But I, I completely accept the, 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 the point that you make. And I think it is unclear, and I think it was unclear for many of us at that time, just what should be looked at, how it could be looked at, and what questions were still to be addressed, because there was lots of people round about saying, well, that's, that's closed, we know that, that's done. Why look at that? So it, it is, uh, is it a fair understanding of what you're trying to convey by, albeit ambiguous words, is we're, we're looking at this, Let's do that first, get that out of the way, and then we'll look at something else if we need to. Is that what you're attempting to say, or are you saying that's all we're going to look at, we're going to look at nothing else? No, I, th I think, I, I don't think we were ever saying we're going to look at nothing else. I, I, I don't think that particular statement ever applied. I think there was constantly a challenge about what else we could look at and how else we could look at it. But I don't think it was ever about saying we won't look at anything else. It was about saying that, you know, we started to look into and and bring out some of the background and some of the history, particularly around a moment in time for issues of particular concern to haemophiliacs in Scotland at that point in time. You know, actually, we can't go any further than, than that at this moment. I don't think we would ever... I genuinely don't think we were ever closing the door and further investigation and inquiry. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll take a break uh, now we'll, we'll, until 10 past 12. 10 past 12 is a little bit later than, than usual. Let me just say to you what um, I, I say to all witnesses at this stage. You're giving evidence on oath. Uh, you must not discuss the evidence you have given, or for that matter, anything you think you may later be asked about with anyone, whoever that anyone is, but you can talk about anything else you like. Thank you. 10 past 12.